Good morning, everyone. God is good. And all the time. Welcome to St. John's United Church of Christ as we gather to worship on this beautiful fall day. And we're glad you're here. I'm glad you're here, those who are here and those who are watching online as well. For those of you who come to Lunch Bunch, there's always some kind of activity that we do that Carol or whoever sets up for us to do. So last Wednesday, there were these nice little leaf decorations laying on the table. And then after we got done eating, you had to turn them over and they have a joke. So Tom Williams, this was his, and I, when he read it, I says, we need to do that in church on Sunday morning. So when I pull in the driveway today, he and Sue are coming out, and guess what he hands me? <laughs> Why did the scarecrow win the Nobel Prize? He was outstanding in his field. Okay. Okay. Uh, we have flowers over here by the pulpit that are there in celebration of the baptism of Karen Lydon's granddaughter, Charlotte Grace Marie Pecora, who was born on the 2nd of May. She's being back baptized in, hi Jack, in Arlington Heights, Illinois today. So congratulations to them as well. But it's not in the announcements. We always talk about it the first Sunday of the month about the fundraiser for the windows. But to have you notice, if you notice how clean these first two are, as opposed to the others. So it takes about a week for each window. So the scaffolding's out there. So uh, that is what's happening uh, with those funds uh, to be those taken care of. So all that does is it makes it harder for you who sit in the sunlight. You know, it gets a little brighter. And the announcements, because of uh, constitutional things, so if you're willing to run, nominations are being accepted for the, the leadership team for the elections we're gonna do later. Uh, if you're interested, please see somebody in the leadership team. The Shoes and Socks September clothing drive through this month, through the, next, the 29th, collecting new shoes and socks of all sizes for, for Camp Washington UCC. It's important, I think, sometimes we forget the things that we do regularly. It's like when you hit your thumb with a hammer and then all of a sudden you realize what you can't use. We don't realize how important shoes and socks are uh, to cover. Um, some of the, the ankle socks that I buy that I wear during the summer, uh, I buy them, I pay a little bit more for expensive ones because they give new ones to place to folks like at Camp Washington. And so it's a way for people to have protection for their feet. Uh, we don't think about it. I know. I'm cleaning Betty's stuff up, and I want to know how, why she had so many shoes, you know. And we, we do. We have more than we need. So this is an opportunity to share, to let people know how important it is so at least these children have a way to have protection. Uh, the chosen list is there. We did meet yesterday. We had a really nice discussion. So if you're willing, if you're able to be with us, I'd, I'd encourage that as well. The trunk or treat coming up on the, end of, or the 19th of October. If you want to participate, there's a list over here by the baptismal font to sign up so we'll know how many people we have. You do not have to be costumed or your vehicle decorated. If you just want to come and open your, your trunk or the hatch or your SUV and sit there with candy, I will be greatly appreciative of the, any chocolate you give me that day. Uh, but, that's, but we just want to make sure we're having something for the kids in the neighborhood that they know uh, that we're here, and so hopefully we can get enough participants. You'll see the neighbor needs special offerings coming up on the first Sunday of October, and the details are there. There'll be some more information as we move towards that Sunday. Uh, last, the congregational meeting is coming up on Sunday, October 27th at 11.15, right after service. I've been put on notice not to preach long that day, that we can be on time, uh, I don't want you all to lose your spot at the restaurant wherever you go after you leave here. But we'll try to do the business of the church, which is really important as well. It's important that we're here every Sunday, but it's also important that we do the work of the church as well. Are there any other announcements for the good of the community that I'm not aware of? If not, let us open our minds and hearts in an attitude that allows God's spirit to move among us as we prepare to worship God this day.
as you are able, please stand and let us all join together in the call to worship. The heavens are telling the story of God, and the firmament proclaims his handiwork. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are sure, making wise the simpler. The precepts of the Lord are right. The commandment of the Lord is clear, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Together we pray, let the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. And now let us join together in the prayer of confession. Faithful Christ, we bow before the transforming power of your love. In its safety, slowly and surely, we become aware of how we cling to our own will, how we hold back parts of our life from you. It is hard for us to understand how to deny ourselves and still stand strong in this world. Forgive us for believing more in worldly standards of strength than in the standard you set on a cross in love. Teach us again the power of your love to heal our broken relationships with you and with others. Help us to trust that we are safe with you. Amen. Hear the good news. 
God chose to redeem us, to bring us from afar, to pardon our iniquities, to remove the stain of our offenses, to draw us close once more and to restore to us our heavenly inheritance through Jesus Christ our Lord. Dearly beloved, believe the good news. Our first reading this morning from Isaiah chapter 50, verses 4 through 9. The Lord has given me a trained tongue that I may know how to sustain the weary with a word. Morning by morning he wakens, wakens my ear to listen to those who are taught. The Lord God has opened my ear and I was not rebellious. I did not turn backward. I gave my back to those who struck me and my cheeks to those who pulled out the beard. I did not hide my face from insult and spitting. The Lord God helps me, therefore I have not been disgraced. Therefore I have set my face like flint and I know that I shall not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand in court together. Who are my adversaries? Let them confront me. It is the Lord God who helps me, who will declare my guilt. All of them will wear out like a garment, and the moth will eat them up. Our second scripture reading today from James chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers and sisters, for you know that we who teach will face stricter judgment. For all of us, for all of us make many mistakes. Anyone who makes no mistakes in speaking is mature, able to keep the whole body in check with a bridle. If we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we guide their whole bodies. Or look at ships, though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, yet they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great exploits. How great a forest is set ablaze by a small fire, and the tongue is a fire. The tongue is placed among our members as a world of iniquity, it stains the whole body, sets on fire the cycle of life, and is itself set on fire by hell. For every species of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature, can be tamed and has been tamed by the human species, but no one can tame the tongue, a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless the Lord and Father, and with it we curse people made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth comes a blessing and a curse. My brothers and sisters, this ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and brackish water? Can a fig tree, my brothers and sisters, yield olives or a grapevine figs? No more can salt water yield fresh. These are the words of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
things as well. Job, jo <laughs> Other jobs as defined, that's what that is. That's the fine print in the job description. I don't know if you noticed during the call to worship, three individuals moved from the third, fourth row from the back to the second row in the front. Justin, was that your idea, my man? <laughs> Drug grandma and mom up with you. Maybe we should block off the whole back of the church, make you all, make you all move up front. As we continue in the Gospel of Mark, uh, we're going to hear today from Mark chapter 8, verses uh, 27 to 38, um, which is, I thought, really ironic because I commented about the, uh, the chosen yesterday. And this first paragraph is exactly what we saw in the video when Peter declares who Jesus is. And then we have this other thing where Jesus is foretelling his death and resurrection. So here are Mark's words. Jesus went on with his disciples, <clears throat> excuse me, to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, and others, Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. And he asked them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered him, you are the Messiah. And then he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. And then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and he said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind and not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any wish to come after me, let them to die themselves, take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? For those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. May God bless this reading, hearing, and understanding of the Holy Word. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth 
and the meditation of our hearts. Be acceptable, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Years ago, I remember driving and hearing uh, a radio spot on one of the uh, Christian stations. I don't even remember what I was listening to at the time. But what caught me, my ear was, it says, if you want to make sure you get the most out of your life, start with your eulogy and work backwards. Start with your eulogy and work backwards. That sort of struck me because um, when you celebrated my uh, 40th anniversary of ordination before my knee surgery, I gave you a list of accomplishments. Two friggin' pages. They just listed churches I've served, classes I've taken, you know, awards I've got. Didn't tell you who I was. Just told you what I did. And someone that I got thinking with Owen, what do you want people to say about you when you're gone? What is the legacy you want to leave behind? And what this commentator was talking about is, is how do you make that legacy you want a reality? How do you make that happen? I think we get in a certain point in our life, there's some life changes that take place uh, that we start to decide um, what priorities are in our lives. We always say a midlife crisis, sometimes it's there, sometimes it's before. But something happens in our lives and we have to decide what is important to us. I think sometimes for, for me, my family talk about this a lot because, uh, especially my brother, because after he retired as an IT guy for Western Southern, he started volunteering for Crossroads Hospice. He's actually not a bad visitation pastor, even though he doesn't think he is. And I think, so they ask him in his interview, he says, how come you're not uncomfortable doing this? And my brother said, well, you know, our dad was a pastor and my brother's a pastor and we deal with death all the time. Our grandparents died young, our dad died young. You know, we don't really think, it. it's just part of, of life, even though we're sad and miss people, but it's, we do that. So we have that sense of mortality understanding that there's life can be short and what's important and so I, I've done I don't we talked Michael and I talked about that after I got here we had done a couple of we did church funerals here and he said I wonder how many I've done and I brought my record book in it's like three between three and four thousand in my 40 years um, and what people might want me to do is to read this list of what they did. That doesn't tell me who you are. My job as the presider of those services is to talk about who you are. I've never in my career ever heard somebody who's at the end of their life say to me, you know, Marty, I wish I would have worked more. They don't say that. Or I wish I had more stuff. They don't tell me that either. Um, I think what they realize more the closer they get to being with God is somehow along the line, and I've expressed that to you because I think a lot of things have gone on in my life in the last three years, is that fundamentally it's about relationship. It's about the relationships that we have with one another, and not just the ones I have with you now, but the ones I've had in the past that I still keep. Those are those important things. That's my first importance is relationships that I keep. They go back and you've heard me talk about where I grew up in Northern Indiana and I get back with those kids I went to elementary school with. And we probably didn't, when we first started meeting, we physically hadn't seen each other for 60 years. And yet when we sit around the table, there's now seven of us that gather, it used to be three. And all we do is we talk about the past and we talk about what we're doing now. And it's almost as if we never were separated, but those were the relationships that are important. There's other stuff that's important. You know, um, we always want to make sure we got enough to live on. So, you know, you have a pension and you invest money and we do those things to make sure we can live okay. Uh, if you like what you do, you put your heart and soul into your vocation. And we do that when we're working. Uh, but those things need to be in place because those are in secondary importance. I think relationships are 
really important to know that you that people see you and you see them and that we understand them but there's only one relationship that we can take beyond this life and that's the one that you and I have with Jesus Christ the one that we understand will be with us even when we're not physically in this place so Jesus says today in this text you know, for what will it profit them to gain the whole world? And he's talking, when he says whole world, I'm interpreting that as prestige, promotion, even if you want to hobnob with a higher echelon, you know, some kind of relationship that makes you look good. So what, it, what will it profit to gain the whole world and then forfeit your life? As I go through my files, I'm still trying to clean stuff up after 40 years. And I, I talk about these cartoons. Calvin and Hobbes was a favorite one of mine. And he was with the comics for a few years ago. But uh, Calvin uh, is a picture of unredeemed humanity. And Hobbes is often critical commentary on that. So there's this one, they're walking along a road somewhere. And Calvin says, a lot of people don't have principles, but I do. I'm a highly principled person. I live according to one principle and I never deviate from it. And Hobbes looks at him and says, what's your principle? And Calvin says, look out for number one. We all have in our life what we call first principles. I've read that term somewhere. First principles. First principles are those things that you and I choose that are our guiding value, our guiding principle in our lives. Accumulate wealth, family first, to live to serve others. Those are some examples. You choose those things, whatever it is that's important to you to decide. So what Jesus is doing in the text today is he's challenging the disciples about calling attention to what you've agreed to do to the first principle of the Christian life how do you understand your relationship and so he says if anyone to become my followers let them deny themselves take up their cross and follow me for what will it profit them he goes on to say that again to gain the whole world and forfeit their life in the video yesterday, was it Nathan that made that commentary about when he wakes up in the morning? Was that? No, it was Nathan. He says about he wakes up and it's God first. Nathan, okay. And Nathan's struggling. And so he says, but when he finds out that he puts God first, that then everything else falls into place. No matter what it is, whether it's a good day or a bad day, it doesn't make any difference because now he's already understood who he is, that he's one of God's creation and child. And so sometimes it's difficult to think. I mean, I knew and I always blamed the church for my dad's death because he could never say no. And that's why I put off going into ministry after I had a, an L. Ed degree. And, you know, you, you find out but you have to put things in perspective. So when I was in seminary, uh, it, you take one administration course, doesn't help you a lot in how you run a church, it's just a class. But they said we all, all we ministers get a blank calendar, whatever denomination you are. And the question was, because at that point we were all having senior pastors as mentors. Mine was Frank Veets over at Faith Church in, in, on Beachmont, or Salem Road in Anderson Township. And I said, Frank, when you get your new church calendar, do you put in all the church activities first and then you put in family? Or do you put in family and the church works around that? And he says, I put in church first. And I had to be I'm very diligent about that uh, when Betty and I first got married that I would do that that I would make sure I had time for family, even though I was serving in, in Kenton County for my first six years. And it's a 13 and a half miles one way to that church from our house. I would always try to be home as often as I could because we were raising our granddaughters. It's important to be home for supper. So you try to work around that. As long as the church work didn't get always in the way, I tried to struggle, even if it meant I went back. 
teach what's important. That was my principle. You know, sometimes, you know, when I spend time with my grandkids, or if you have children, you know, take them out, fly a kite, go sledding in the backyard, all those little things, you, that work will be there when I get back. Do we take time for that? Or is it just easier to say, oh, I'll see it later, and I'll take care of that later? It, my parents, when I was growing up, we weren't allowed to bring any magazines, newspapers to the table when my brother had his kids and my mom started helping take care of them. Her rule was she had like one of those old baskets we used to have like collect, we have one here at the church, you put the donations in and kind of dinners. That was her telephone basket. And all the cell phones went in the basket. And that even extended to us. If we were, if we were at her house, there were gonna be no phones on that table, okay? Because it's time to talk. It's time to relate to one another, um, whoever it is, parent to child, children, whatever. You have to be able to talk to people. To put Christ before everything else is, is hard. You have to deny other things, you know, just in our everyday work. I mean, to deny the tongue, to gossip and curse, we heard that today as well. Instead, do you speak Christ to others? Do you talk about your faith? Do you talk about the church? Do you talk about why you're here? Do you share that with others or you just complain about what's going on? You know, um, do you deny the time away if you can get it? You know, do you take time? You, know, you took time to be here this morning. Do you take time for devotions during the week? Is that, you know, you have to be intentional about when we say we believe and that we believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. It's intentional that we do these things. So do we take time to do this? You know. So when I look at the prayer list, you know, I'm being very intentional. Sometimes, I'll tell you the truth, if I don't write little notes, I can't remember why I'm praying for you, but I mention your name. And I figure God will figure that out but at least I raised you in my consciousness. Do we take time to do those things? You know, um, I get deluged as you do with emails and hard copy ads that come to, all I'm getting is ads in my mailbox. I don't even know why I have a mailbox anymore. But you know, all they want to, they want to sell me something. They want to give us something, they want another credit card. You know, all those things, they want you to be able to spend more money. I'm tired of getting my Amazon emails just because I mail stuff to my kids out of town. But I don't want all that extra stuff. So I think about what it's important. There was another Calvin and Hobbes cartoon and they're out on a walk again. And Calvin says, live for the moment. That's my motto. That's his first principle as I mentioned earlier. Live for the moment, that's my motto. You never know how long you've got. You could step into the road tomorrow and wham, and get hit by a cement truck, then you'd be sorry you put off your pleasures. That's why I say, live for the moment. Hobbes says, what's your motto? Look down the road. I think that's what we need to do as individuals, as Christians, to look down the road. Don't stay here in this spot where you are in your journey of faith. Part of my job with you is when you read my annual report, is you know, I just being your pastor for this past year. I'll be here a year in October. Is to just be your pastor. But we have work to do as we move forward. It might get delayed a little if I get my surgery on my other knee, but we have this work to do. And we need to look down the road about what it is we want to be and how we want to share and how do we do mission and ministry. We need to look down the road. Don't just stay here. This, is not, this doesn't satisfy me. It shouldn't satisfy you. We need to think about what we want to do. And what are the accomplishments we can do? What is the mission and ministry that can occur it's great to hear your history. 
It's always great. You know, and when I looked at that list, you know, that I uh, compiled for you, I've been probably in eight or nine churches in my life and career. And every church has a story. And it's important to know how we got here. But where are we going? And how are we going to get there? Are we Christ-centered? Are we about doing God's work? That's what's important. You know, is it important to be about being those faithful people that we have agreed to be when we said we follow Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? So we need to look down the road and look at the future of what can be, what will matter in the end. Faith is what we take into the next life, nothing else. Just our faith. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our affirmation of faith today is the UCC statement of faith. It's called in a form of a doxology. Um, the first statement of faith was done at the first synod meeting in 1959. Uh, this was uh, one that they adapted in 1982 uh, that they've tried to make a little more uh, inclusive. So it uses a few other different words. So if you've memorized it like I do, you're going to have to read it uh, because it's not the same as, as what we learned that growing up. So I'm going to invite those who are able to please stand as you're able and let us affirm our faith together using these words. We believe in you, O God, eternal spirit, God of our Savior Jesus Christ and our God, and to your deeds we testify. You call the worlds into being, create persons in your own image, and set before each one the ways of life and death. You seek in holy love to save all people from aimlessness and sin. You judge people and nations by your righteous will, declare through prophets and apostles. In Jesus Christ, the man of Nazareth, our crucified and risen Savior, you have come to us and shared our common lot, conquering sin and death and reconciling the world to yourself. You bestow upon us your Holy Spirit, creating and renewing the Church of Jesus Christ, binding and covenant faithful people of all ages, tongues, and races. You call us into your church to accept the cost and joy of discipleship, to be your servants in the service of others, to proclaim the gospel to all the world, to resist the powers of evil, to share in Christ's baptism and to eat at his table to join him in his passion and victory. You promise to all who trust you forgiveness of sins and fullness of grace, courage in the struggle for justice and peace, your presence in trial and rejoicing, and eternal life in your realm which has no end. Blessing and honor, glory and power be unto you. Amen.
You may be seated. As we come to God in prayer this day, are there any joys or concerns to be brought forth to this community of faith this morning? Anybody behind? Diana. Diana, go ahead. Uh, our son and daughter Mo will be married 23 years today. I mention this only because they got married on the Tuesday prior to 9-11. So they got married that following Saturday. So, and it's survived <laughs> 23 years. So, I just it's a nice joy. Oh. Yeah. Thank you. Any others? If not, you know, always in the bulletin we have that list, and there's a homebound of the week and birthdays and anniversaries, and to take care of those, make sure you remember those folks. I mentioned my cousin Donald uh, last week. He had stints put in last Tuesday. Maybe I'm a little overly cautious. He shows, he raises uh, uh, Dal the big Dalmatian dogs. Great. Great Danes, thank you. They look like Dalmatians to me. I don't know. They, uh, but uh, three days after the stints were put in, he went out and did a dog show. Of course, I called him some names I can't say out loud here, but, but anyway. But he's doing okay. He, he survived that. Uh, we have, uh, is it Kelsey having surgery on Wednesday? So, um, uh, Kelly's daughter, so we'll pray for her while she's doing that. Kelly's going to take off that day to, uh, to, to be with her, so we can do that. Uh, Peggy Westland and others who are on hospice care uh, to continue to, to remember them. Um, Carol Fickinger's with us. We found, I found out you fell and haven't been with us a while, so you're back. Glad to see you today that you're back. Uh, yesterday, I, or Friday, I did a service for Ken Gallo over at, uh, in the west side of Cincinnati, but he lived up in the northern part of town. He grew up, and he and I were two years apart at high school. Um, he was real active. He was an IT guy somewhere, and then he ended up running all the coaches, referees, and umpires in Hamilton County. And uh, was doing that. It was a huge service. People came, athletic directors from every high school that I could probably mention. Uh, he was there. So I'd ask for prayers for that family. And if you've seen in the bulletin, um, our dear friend, my mentor, my colleague, Henry Marksberry, died. And uh, last Tuesday. And so this Tuesday evening at Dobling and Fort Thomas will be uh, visitation 6 to 8. And then on Wednesday morning will be visitation at 10 o'clock and the service will be here at 11. Uh, Dan Wyangaisi has been the lead on this. Um, as you may well or may not know, every time you read anything about Henry, uh, this is the only church that's, this, this is the only church where he was installed. He did a lot of, you know, associate pastor stuff, and he did what I do now, he did fill in. Uh, but he, this was the one place where he was, so it always keeps coming up in his story. Um, and so it's important that we come back here. But when he did one of his interim stints, it was at First Church, which used to be on Hoffner Street in Northside, and when they moved up to College Hill and built a building, uh, when Larry left after that, he got them through that time, Henry came. And he knew Dan from his pastoral counseling at Bethesda. And he groomed Dan, and Dan's been there over 25 years. So Dan's sort of the family pastor. And so he's grooming it. It will be a big service uh, uh, because of uh, Henry's family. There's some, there'll be some Jewish prayers. There'll be some Christian prayers. And there'll be some music. Um, so we're coming here to celebrate a life that was well lived. Somewhere I read, and I know this, that Henry's one of the few people that I know who probably read every book on his bookshelf. You know, he's very knowledgeable and shared his life with all of us in some way, shape, or form. So uh, if you can't be here, continue to pray for the family. It would be greatly appreciated. So as we continue to remember all these uh, individuals and situations, we're always aware of what's uh, going on in the world. We're in the middle of a political blizzard of whatever is going to happen. Uh, we need to keep praying for discernment, decision. Uh, we need to pray for our communities. 
You know, we need to pray for ourselves and the situations that we're all in. You know, we always put on a good show, but we all have something we're dealing with. So continue to pray for, for everyone. So as we do that, let us uh, sort of focus and settle down and take a deep breath and let it out. And breathe in God. Let it out. Breathe in. Breathe out. Breathe in. Almighty and holy God, remind us that as we journey in this world and we get restless, remind us that when we found you and your son Jesus that we became more settled in our journey of faith. And as we continue to journey, we continue to see those other parts of who Jesus is for us. For some, Jesus is like the prophets of old for some, Jesus is a great miracle worker. For some, he is a brother. For some, he is a savior. For some, as Peter said, he is the Messiah. He is who we need him to be for each one of us in our journey. But God reminds us, oh God, you remind us that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And so as we have journeyed in this faith, we confess as we worship and as we join the church and as we continue to move that Jesus is our Messiah. So we pray, O oh God, that you keep us on the path, uh, that we may continue to follow Jesus to this invitation he's challenging us about to look down the road, to see what you can bring to us, what is important in our lives. So as we journey this week, oh God, we let us pray each day uh, to remember that we are your creation, that we are your children, that we are called by the name of your son. We, we take the word Christian, that we are forgiven, that we are loved, and that we are to be your people. So as we gather to worship this day, may we be strengthened for this week to come. But also as we pray, we are reminded of the individuals and situations that have been raised aloud and silently. We especially pray for those who are making decision, for those who may be recovering from surgery, for those who may be prepping for surgery, for those who are dealing with illness, for those who are mourning and grieving, for those who need to just know they are not alone, make us aware of them in our journey within our circle when we work and play. May we be aware of each other in this next week, that we might be able to share the good news to those who need to see it, and maybe just by being in their presence. But most of all, God, we thank you for your son, Jesus the Christ, who has taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
Through our offerings, we are invited to put God first in our lives, to show our gratitude and our commitment. We owe everything to God, our lives, our health, people who love us, meaningful work and activities. Let us respond in proportion to our gratitude. Our ushers may now come forward.
Please join me in our prayer of dedication. For the sake of the gospel, we offer our lives and resources to the working of your will. Let no one be ashamed of what they bring or who they are, for Christ is not ashamed of us and receives us as we come. So receive our offering now to the glory of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. That last hymn is one that maybe some of us sang when we joined a church or a confirmation, take my life, let it be. That's what we did when we joined a church. And sometimes we have to be conscious of what we do as we walk through this world day by day. So share the good news with those who need to hear it. Look down the road, see what's going on in this world. Share with others who need to hear it. So until we meet again, let us go in the name of God. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, let us go in peace. Amen.